Thank you for joining us for the Our Stories program. I know we've got a lot of uh, dedicated folks that are here today. So great to see all of you and see your names and we'll see you a little bit later and hopefully on camera. Um, today, uh, we will be hearing from Kevin Schindler, um, who is a historian with the Lowell Observatory. Um, some of you may have seen his presentation previously. And so he's gonna be talking about the 1894 expedition to Arizona that led to the establishment of Lowell Observatory, um, which is a very interesting story. And um, I wanna thank the Friends of the Library for their funding of these series that we do throughout the year. And of course our partnership with the Chandler Museum um, we do have, um, we are working on planning for the next season of our stories, um, which will start up in July. And um, we are also just as a heads up, I'm starting to plan for when we're going to actually return this program in person. And if we are going to have a hybrid approach to it, where we might be recording or live streaming the presentation while we are also in person with a group of folks. So we're just trying to work on sort of technology and when that works, and I may be reaching out to our email group to hear your feedback about what you think you might like to see with this series as we move toward the fall. Um, and um, as I mentioned, we will do a question and answer after Kevin um, begins the program or once he finishes his program. And um, I think with that, I will turn it over to Kevin to tell us another piece of Arizona history. Thanks, Jean, and thanks everybody for joining us today. Um, as Jean said, my name is Kevin Schindler. I'm the historian up at Lowell Observatory, and I also um, do a lot of historic research on, research on other stuff, um, particularly about Arizona, also some baseball and other stuff that I like. Um, I, I'm, I'm actually, the background is maybe kind of funny as a curtain because I'm in a hotel room in Washington, DC. I'm here for a few days doing research for a book um, I'm working on about the Lincoln Memorial um, because next year is the centennial of its construction. Um, May 30th, 1922 is when it opened. And so I'm working with a fellow that lives here in DC and we're um, doing a book about that. And so um, it's been a lot of fun. And, um, and actually this morning, I, I was got my exercise in by going over to Arlington National Cemetery and paying my respects to um, some astronauts, presidents, um, other people that are, you know, really contributed a lot to life. So anyways, I, I do a fair bit of research on different things. Um, and Today we're going to talk about, you know, it's, it's about the founding of a science organization, Lowell Observatory, that I suspect many of you have been to. Um, but it, it's, it, we're not going to talk that much science today. It's going to be more just the history of, of what happened. Um, because, you know, we think about a place like Lowell Observatory. It's one of the oldest science organizations in the Southwest and the oldest in Arizona. Um, and it's kind of fun to look back at such places and see how it, how it all began. And, you know, see, in this case, it began 18 years before Arizona was even a state. It goes back to statehood or to territorial days. And so, um, you know, that's not very old if you go to the East Coast, and that's really young if you go to Europe. But in the American Southwest, you know, 125 plus years is, is fairly old. Um, so, you know, when you look back at its, at its founding, um, we're going back to a time that's a lot different than it is now in Arizona. So let me share my screen here and get this up here and then start the program. And in theory, you should see a title slide here with four guys and a telescope. Sounds like a movie. Um, so I, I've really enjoyed talking about this um, expedition because, like I said, it takes us back to a time when Arizona was a lot different. Um, the really the frontier days, um, you didn't expect to see scientists or people with telescopes and other scientific equipment 
running around the territory. It was it was a very unusual sight, um, and it's a it's a thing that started with um, this person, the guy second from the left. Um, he's the one that started it all. His name is Percival Lowell, and he's from the Lowell family of Massachusetts. If you're familiar with with um, the Boston area, he was one of the blue blood families from there, and he had. You know, to give an idea of how significant the family was, just Percival's generation, um, he was the oldest, and he founded this observatory in Flagstaff. His one brother, um, Abbott Lawrence Lowell, was president of Harvard for 24 years. One sister, he had three sisters. One married a relative of Theodore Roosevelt. Another one won the Pulitzer Prize, um, Amy, for poetry. So it was a well-to-do family. And if you were a Lowell, you were expected to do something, not just sit on the family name, but to extend the family name. And so with that mentality, um, it, you understand why there are lawyers and judges, um, statesmen, writers, artists, um, scientists, a, a lot of different um, careers that they made you know, a big name in. And so that was um, something that drove Percival Lowell. And in fact, it was a little unusual for him because he was the oldest. And, you know, in, in that culture, you know, he should have been the one to stay at home and carry on the family name in the Boston area and serve, you know, on the board of, you know, trustees of different organizations and the Chamber of Commerce and all this. But he wasn't interested in that so much. Um, he, after graduating from Harvard, um, in 1876, he did work for a family business for years um, in textiles, and that's how the Lowell family made their money. And in fact, the first company town in, our, in America um, was a town founded by several business people, including a Lowell. Um, and so, you know, Percival had this expectation he better do something important in life. So he worked for the family business for a while. And then he, had, he really had wanderlust. So he went overseas and spent 10 years in Korea and Japan and really immersing himself in society there. He, he, he studied the people and their um, customs and their religions. And he ended up writing several books based on his experiences. And he, he actually made a pretty good name for himself. And in fact, even today, if you go to Japan, um, his, his name and picture still show up. Um, just last year, a friend of mine who works in conjunction with Lowell Observatory, he came back from a visit over in Japan, and he brought me this container of cookies, and Percival Lowell's picture is on the front. And so they, they still respect him over there and honor him, um, again, for, for being one of the first Westerners to really try to understand the Eastern culture. And so he started making a name for himself. Um, certainly, but it wasn't big enough. And so when he came back after 10 years, he thought, what am I going to do with my career, really, to, you know, to carry on that family name? And he decided to go into astronomy. Um, he was inspired by an Italian astronomer named Giovanni Schiaparelli. And in 1877, Schiaparelli became a well-known name in science circles because uh, Mars that year was relatively close to Earth so that it was looked bigger and brighter. Um, and it's the year that an American astronomer named Asaph Hall discovered the two moons of Mars um, from the Naval Observatory um, here in Washington, DC, where I am right now. Um, but by the 1890s, um, Schiaparelli was losing his eyesight. And Percival Lowell was inspired by Schiaparelli's work and decided, I'm going to take over what he started doing and continue his work. And remember what I said that Lowell was driven by doing something big. And so he wasn't so interested in just studying Mars and, and looking at detail. He was interested in something big. And what Schiaparelli had did were these linear markings um, that were called canali. And Percival Lowell looked at them and others, he wasn't the only one, but he looked at them and thought, you know, nothing in nature can create um, such linear markings, so straight for so long. 
they must have been made by some sort of intelligent life. And so Percival Lowell just called them canals, implying that some sort of intelligent life had built them. And his idea was that there was um, Mars was a, a dead, a dying planet, and um, it was drying out. And so this intelligent life built these canals to bring water from the ice caps to the rest of the planet. And it sounded like a great story. We know today that it's not true, um, but it's interesting because, you know, Lowell wasn't a crackpot. Um, he was an intelligent person. He was from a mainstream family. Um, he just had these ideas. I think, again, partly he was driven by doing something big and proving life on another world was big. <laughs> If he could do that, if he could discover this life out there, that would certainly carry on the Lowell name. Um, and so that's why he decided to found the observatory. And this picture, um, he served on a Korean delegation uh, for several years while he was overseas. He's the second one from the left, by the way, if you didn't realize that. And so he decided he's gonna study Mars and prove that there's intelligent life there. and and look at these supposed canals and see if that, that is uh, life. And so he came back, he was back in the United States. Again, this is the early 1890s, 1893. And he decides, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna study, do space. And Percival Lowell was from a mindset that if he's gonna do astronomy, he's gonna do it on his own terms. So that means he's gonna build his own observatory. And he certainly has the wherewithal to do that. Um, the family is, is very wealthy. And so he decides he's gonna build his own observatory to look for life on Mars. But he also realized the problem with doing this because historically observatories were located in large cities on the East Coast and where most people lived. And um, large cities are where the universities were. And so that was a typical place to put an observatory. But by the late 1890s, we had the Industrial Revolution, which had a lot of factories polluting the sky, covering up um, the sky, um, so you couldn't see the stars and planets as easily. And also at this time, we're getting a proliferation of electric lights. Um, they're becoming very common in downtown places like Boston. Um, and that light, when it shines up in the sky, you know, the, the more shining up, the less you can see of the stars and planets. So first of all, Lowell realized, okay, he wants to build this observatory, but he better do it in a place that doesn't have this pollution of smoke and light. So he decides to go to the American Southwest. And um, there, there's not much electricity. We don't have to worry about that. There are no factories. And so he decides he's going to go to the American Southwest. And when I say he decides he's going to go. Um, he, he hires somebody to help him out a little bit, to help him find an appropriate place. Because you don't just set up a telescope. You know, you think of the American Southwest. Oh, you set up in the desert. There's no clouds to obscure your view. That's true. But there's other stuff in the air, like heat and even water vapor, even in a desert area. But especially like in a desert, you'll have heat coming off the ground. And it creates this shimmering in the in the air. Um, you've seen it if you've driven down a flat road, and it looks like there's you know kind of a mirage. It looks like there's water until you get closer. Um, and so that that kind of um, effect isn't very good because you're just with a telescope you're just magnifying it. So the American Southwest was great because it was dry, but Lowell had to find the right place, a place that didn't have all that heat vapor causing the mirages, um, and ideally a high location, because you think about the air above us, and when you look at stars and planets, you're looking through that air, and that's what causes the twinkling. Um, the light coming from those objects passes through the air, and the air um, bends the light some and causes it to twinkle. And the same thing if you've ever been in a swimming pool and open your eyes and, you know, everything is kind of, kind of blurry, it's the same effect. It's more obvious in the water. Um, so a higher location means the higher you are, the less air you have to look through. So that's why most observatories are at high locations. Um, and some of this astronomers were just to understand. And so Lowell was one of the first ones, in fact, 
to realize, you know, it's not important not only what, what instruments you use and the people that are doing the observing, but also the location. And so he decides to send an assistant out to Arizona territory. This is 1894, 18 years before Arizona is even a state. So he decides to send this fellow, Andrew Douglas, and Andrew Douglas had helped um, um, Harvard College Observatory on a research uh, expedition down in Peru a few years earlier. So he was kind of used to being out in the field and rough and tumble places. So Douglas sends, our uh, first of all, sends Douglas with this six inch diameter telescope. And this telescope is, we still have it at Lowell Observatory. I like this tripod. There's a couple of regular legs and they have a, a tree right here that they've used. But he sends, he sends Douglas with a telescope and then several different um, meteorological instruments because his goal is, again, to find the best place to set up an observatory. So he's going to go to a place that's fairly dry, you know, the Southwest, try to find high ele elevation to look through less air. And also, once he gets there, test different places around the territory using these instruments um, and look at the weather patterns and humidity and other things like this that all affect the quality of doing astronomy research. And so Douglas loads all this stuff up. And on February 28th, 1894, he leaves Boston and heads out west, um, intent on finding a place for the observatory. And Percival Lowell, I should add, was not a man of patience. Um, he expected Douglas to go out there for a couple of weeks, test a few places, set up a site and get observing. Um, while, while Percival Lowell had a lot of foresight in terms of where to go with, you know, drier climate and such, um, he, he could have done better probably with, with the surveying because, you know, you look, you're going to a place to see what, you know, the weather and, and really the climate is like more than just for a couple of weeks. You want to see how it is throughout the whole year. So really, if this was done scientifically in the best way, he would have done site testing surveys for a year or two, um, looking at how the conditions change by season and such. But, but back then, this was all kind of new stuff, this site testing. So Douglas leaves February 28th, and he arrives in Arizona Territory in March. He arrived on March 6th. And he came in down here in the southeast part of the state. And um, this, I'm going to show this map several times. The red shows how he traveled across the territory. I said state, but it's still a territory. Um, the red shows him traveling by train. And then the blue is when he took stagecoaches. So he came in on March 6, um, came down, he went to Benson. And then down here, he took a stagecoach over to Tombstone. And this is only, what, 13 years after the gunfight at OK Corral. Um, and so while that gunfight has been, you know, blown out of proportion probably um, <laughs> throughout historic times, it was still a big event in the territory and it gives you an idea of the timing. So it was a 13 years after that. So Douglas, um, he, he tests a few different places at each, at each uh, community he goes to. So in Tombstone, he tested three different places. And, you know, so far this sounds pretty easy. You get on a train, you take some instruments, you, you find a place in the middle of nowhere on the side of a hill and you set up your telescopes. Well, it wasn't quite that easy because first um, the travel by train and, and stagecoach with all this equipment um, wasn't always easy. And in fact, we'll talk later about how um, a certain stagecoach driver wouldn't let him get on with the telescope he had. I'll talk about that a little bit later. So there, were, there was that issue of just the logistics. Uh, there weren't automobiles to load up and drive, you know, wherever he wanted to go. He had to, you know, take the train, a stagecoach, and then get up the side of the hill, maybe on foot, dragging all that equipment, or maybe with a horse or a horse and wagon. And so these are all things that he had to figure out. 
Um, another thing that was um, sort of interesting was on the stagecoaches, the the drivers had had they were armed, they had rifles with them uh, because there was concern about uh, marauders. One of them was the so-called Apache Kid um, shown in the middle here. And the Apache Kid is a legendary character, a, a real person um, that lived in Arizona territory. Um, but he was blamed for a lot of different crimes that happened um, back in those days. And so stagecoach drivers, they were well armed in case they got attacked by the Apache Kid. So Ender Douglas writes about this in his field notes. And that's where we get all this information. In fact, he kept meticulous notes um, and made some drawings and took some pictures. And so, so it was a real concern coming out to, you know, the Wild West. It really was the Wild West um, that he was coming to, and not with guns and ammunition, but with telescopes. And so, uh, you know, you can imagine what that would have been like coming out here. So the first site he goes to, um, I said in Tombstone, he sets up a couple different places. This, most of these pictures I show you are ones he took. And so this is from um, station two at a, at a mine. Um, I think it was a silver mine. Um, and you can see there's nothing around here. I mean, there's some brush and such, but you don't have to worry about trees getting away of your view and certainly not much rain. But he set up the instruments and he looked at several different stars and a couple of planets through the telescope to see how clear they looked, essentially. And then he also measured the, you know, had his barometer and thermometer and other instruments where he's testing the air. And, you know, Douglas would have stayed here for a lot longer, but Percival Lowe was kind of egging him to try several places and then make a decision. And so that was something Douglas had to kind of balance. And so he, he tested a couple sites there. This is the third site. Um, reservoir Hill, there's a big water reservoir there. And this is again the telescope, that telescope, and several of the locals that came out. Um, you can imagine here's this, you know, what looks like an Eastern dandy. He's got these funny looking scientific instruments. Um, and so he drew a lot of attention. A lot of people that were skeptical about this Eastern dandy. But there are also a lot of people who were, you know, really pleased to have him here because, you know, we think this is Arizona in 1890s. There was a big push by a lot of citizens around the territory, um, a big push for statehood, um, because that would mean a lot more, there are a lot of benefits be, to being a state in the union rather than territory. And so community leaders, saw um, this guy coming with his telescope and the possibility of setting up an, a scientific organization. And they saw, you know, some dollar signs. They saw jobs. Um, and these are all things that would help with the push for statehood. Um, you know, if they set up a, this scientific organization here, you know, they'd need people to work there. And maybe they would build some facilities that would take, that would require people to be hired to build them. And maybe money would come into the community through this. So people like this at Tombstone and other communities really came out um, to, to welcome Andrew Douglas in general. There are some stories about him being wined and dined, taken to bars, um, and even some, some um, stories I've heard that he visited a few brothels that, um, that the locals took him to. But, I, I've never seen any actual evidence of, of him visiting those. Maybe um, he didn't just didn't record that kind of stuff in his notes. But I mean, he was pretty busy because all, all any um, clear night he was out with the telescopes. And then during the daytime, he was talking with community leaders and seeing, you know, what they could offer. Um, if he set up the observatory there, you know, will they will they be able to offer some land, um, for instance? And, and also he wanted to learn about the place and the people. Um, it was not only, you know, I mean, the most important thing was finding a good location to look at the skies, but also he was looking at a place where maybe it would be nice for the ladies to visit, the wives of scientists. There weren't too many female scientists back then, but certainly spouses um, that would travel along. 
Um, and, you know, what was it like to live there in general? Um, so he spent, he spent all his time really busy with doing observatory stuff at, or astronomy stuff at night, and then during the daytime learning about um, that particular location and the people. So after several days at Tombstone, he gets back on the stagecoach and then the train, and then he heads to the Northwest and stops in Tucson. And Tucson was sort of a, I say a burgeoning community, I guess it sort of was. Um, there wasn't a lot of burgeoning in 1894 in Arizona, but it was certainly a community. Um, and so we visited a few sites here. And this is again, our drawings he made. Um, some of you might be familiar with Sentinel Peak and Turtleback Peak. Um, maybe you know more by their modern names. Sentinel is better known as A Mountain and um, Turtleback is Tuma Mock Hill. And today, both of these um, hills are pretty famous, um, at least locally. A Mountain is so-called because of the big A that students at U of A paint periodically. Um, and Tuma Mock Hill um, has a, um, the desert research lab has been there for more than a century. Um, there's archeological remains. Um, Stewart Observatory has a telescope up there in modern times. Um, so these are sites that Douglas tested um, to see what it was like. And then again, during the daytime, learning about other things. And he learned that there's a lot of scorpions, a lot of uh, tarantulas and other spiders. And this wasn't necessarily a good or bad thing. It was just something he noted in his notebooks um, that, um, you know, it's a, a little bit different wildlife than you get in the Boston area um, if you come out to, to Tucson. But overall, the conditions were decent. The weather wasn't, wasn't perfect, but it was all right. Um, but he, he um, then, after that, after several days there, he went up to Tempe. Again, took the stagecoach up there um, from Tucson up and over to Tempe and tested a couple sites there. He was there for 10 days. And Tempe was another place that was sort of growing. Um, they had a little bit of uh, um, college that was starting there, um, actually right around here. There's a couple of buildings you can see. But he, he took his telescopes. Remember, I said he was going to try to set up on higher places. And so he went to the top of this little hill here and did some testing there, um, station seven and eight. And I think we're pleased, probably, that he didn't set the observatory up there because that hill developed through the years. Um, that's a mountain in Tempe, um, also named because Arizona State University students draw their big A and paint it there. But the football stadium is there now. Um, that If he had set up shop there, it would have to been moved as the university grew. Um, it's, it's doubtful, I think, that if he set it up there, the university wouldn't have expanded because he set up a telescope there. Um, so, so in hindsight, you know, this wouldn't have been such a good place. Tucson, you know, the Tumamak Hill and Turtleback, they would have been great for years, but today there's too much light um, right there also. And so, um, you know, this is why testing several different places. You know, he didn't know, they didn't know how much some of these places would develop, um, but still you want to get to know as much about the community as possible and 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 look and see if if that's you know factor made because Tucson, I mean uh, Tempe was expected to be growing with the little college there that grew into ASU. So he's there for 10 days and then he goes um, he's going to go up to Prescott. And so on March 27th he's ready to leave Tempe. And so he finds a stagecoach driver and asks him to um, take him along the old Black Canyon Highway that, you know, I-17 um, follows part of that today. So you take old, old Black Canyon Highway and then you cut across the mountains through the Bradshaw Mountains. And it was a really hazardous um, road, a real hazardous ride on the stagecoach. Um, but there was also another problem. <laughs> Because Douglas, when he got to the stagecoach, the driver looked at him and this telescope he had, that big telescope, 
that thing is, a, is about seven feet long. So we had it in a big box that sort of looked like a coffin. And he also had the tripod. He had them you know, together in a box. And the stagecoach driver looked at him and said, you're not taking that on my stagecoach. And supposedly because um, it looked kind of like a coffin and that was a bit creepy. Um, so, so he told Douglas, I'll take you. I'm not taking that box. So Douglas um, found a train and put the big box with the equipment on the train. So while he took the stagecoach from Tempe um, over to Prescott, the, the train um, went over to El Paso, up to Albuquerque, west to Ash Fork, and south to Prescott, and got there at about the same time as the stagecoach did. It took about a day. And that tells you how bad that stagecoach ride was because the train was going all over um, and Douglas's trip was fairly straight. And still the train got there at about the same time. So he got into, got into Prescott the next day um, and it was a long 30 hour trip. It was a miserable trip. Um, 30 hours on a stagecoach with a couple stops um, is just not a comfortable thing. But he got there and he set up shop and um, he had a couple stations there that he tried out. Um, he didn't spend as much time there. Um, and, you know, I'm not quite sure why he spent 10 days in one place and only a few days in another. But by this point, you know, he had been in Arizona for going nearly a month, uh, three weeks to this point. And by this point, Percival Lowell, they were exchanging telegrams the whole way. So as Douglas did observations, he would send a telegram um, to Lowell and let him know how things were going. And so by this point, Lowell was getting kind of antsy. And he said, can you just find a spot? Because he really wanted to start his observing. And Douglas said, okay, I understand, but I'd like to test a few more places. And um, one place he thought about testing was um, Castle Creek at Castle Hot Springs, um, which at one time had a pretty neat resort there. And I think that facility is still there. But um, none other than Bucky O'Neill of Rough Rider fame. Uh, many of you are familiar with Bucky O'Neill and I've talked about him, in fact, I think to this group before. Um, Bucky O'Neill was a, was a Arizona classic, um, you know, one of the one of the great people of Arizona history. He was sheriff of Yavapai County. He was mayor of Prescott. Um, he was in, he owned his own newspaper. Um, he was a judge. He was a school superintendent. Um, he did, you know, pretty much everything. And then he he died in the Spanish American War when he took a bullet um, through the head. In fact, I met, I visited his grave this morning. I was telling you I was at Arlington, so I went to pay respects to him. But Bucky O'Neill was a real leader in Prescott area, and he suggested to Douglas to try um, Castle Hot Springs. But Douglas, by this point, Lowell said, just try one more place. Go to Flagstaff, and then let's just make a decision. So, so um, even though Bucky O'Neill suggested that, um, he didn't he didn't actually get there. Um, and you can see here a picture of Bucky O'Neill and suggesting that Castle or Castle Creek Hot Springs was a great spot because you could really see the southern skies. And that's really where you're going to see the planets. I mean, you could you could see that they would be doing research on stuff besides planets, um, you know, stars and such. But remember, I said Percival Lowell's first goal, his real mission was to prove intelligent life on Mars. And Mars, like the other planets, um, follow a path through the sky called the ecliptic, which is essentially kind of where the sun and the moon, kind of that path also. So it's kind of in the southern part of the sky from where we are. And so um, O'Neill was pointing out that, Becky O'Neill was pointing out this would be a good spot um, for that. Um, and remember I was saying, how Douglas at nighttime, he'd set up the telescope and other instruments during the daytime. He set up some of the instruments also, but also was getting to know the community. And at this point pointed out that Tombstone, Phoenix and Prescott have good hotels where the ladies can stay. Um, so that was, 
that was kind of a big thing for, for Percival Lowell because um, he expected um, to bring a secretary out and he didn't have any females on staff at the time. He didn't, I mean, his staff was him and Andrew Douglas, but it was something that he certainly considered. So after leaving Prescott, um, the train goes up to Ash Fork and then east Flagstaff. And Douglas arrives in Flagstaff on April 3rd. Again, this is 1894. And the first night he stayed at the Bank Motel or commercial or hotel, I mean, no motels back in that day. Um, it was called the Bank Hotel or the commercial, um, it was sometimes called also. But the Bank Hotel, this building still stands. It's across, roughly across from the train station in downtown Flagstaff. So this is the first place he stayed when he got to town. Um, after that, he stayed at the home of uh, Matt Reardon, Dennis Matt Reardon and his wife, because Matt Reardon, um, if you've been to Flagstaff, you might know Reardon Mansion State Park. Uh, Matt Reardon was the older brother who initially bought into the company. Um, and then his brothers, um, Timothy and Mike, came in and they, they ran it for years. But Matt Reardon was a real community builder. And just like I said before, community leaders around the territory were seeing the value of having a science organization in their backyard. So Matt Reardon wanted to wine and dine Andrew Douglas. So he said, don't, you know, don't stay at the hotel, stay at my house. And I'll show you um, the best the Flagstaff has to offer. Um, and again, I said the Matt Reardon was a, a community builder. If somebody important was coming in town, Matt Reardon was there. Um, he got to know John Wesley Powell, shown in the lower right picture. Um, he became very good friends with him. Again, Powell was a man of action um, and, uh, you know, somebody with a big name in Washington. Um, that's just the kind of person that Matt Reardon wants to know um, to, to encourage them to do more in the Flagstaff community. Now, it turns out, if you go to, to uh, Flagstaff today, um, you get into town, then you go on West Route 66, just a mile, less than a mile. There's a little hill called Mars Hill. Um, for an obvious reason I'll talk about in a minute. And this is where the mill used to be. It was one of the smokestacks and some buildings. And Matt Reardon's house was near this. So he told Andrew Douglas to go up um, to the top of that hill and set up your telescope and do some site testing there. And I, I wish Andrew Douglas was still around so I could ask him this question. Um, remember one of the reasons that Percival Lowell sent him to Arizona was to escape the smoke pollution. And yet he's gonna do site testing right where these smokestacks are. Um, so I don't know if he had, did it out of courtesy because Matt Reardon asked him to, but whatever, Douglas did some site testing there and found that conditions were decent. And they weren't necessarily any better than um, like Tucson or Tombstone. And they were good, but not necessarily better. But by this point, Percival Lowell was really antsy and said, if Flagstaff's good, you're there, let's just set up the observatory. Um, this is what it looks like today. There's a day's in, let me go back again. So there's the side of the hill. And somewhere, somewhere in this area, is where he set up the telescope. Um, and so somewhere, if you can see my cursor, somewhere right around there um, is where he set the telescope. This is, this is from the top of the hill, um, not quite on the edge. You can see on the, this is a local on a horse. And then here's the telescope covered with canvas. So Douglas would drag it up the side of the hill and then leave it set up during the daytime and then take the tarp off at night to view. Um, and again, imagine if I go back here, this is a pretty steep hill to get up. Um, but that was typical of what he had to do. He had to drag this seven foot long telescope and his tripod up that hill and set it up. Um, it wasn't easy. I mean, he probably, in this case, used a horse to get it up there. So April 16th, you know, Douglas is still talking about testing other areas. Percival Lowell says, you're there, Flagstaff it is. Just hurry up and get the dome built. 
And this says um, Boston 16th of this April to A.E. Douglas, Flagstaff period, hurry preparations for dome, signed Lowell. And so it's gonna be Flagstaff. He's done this testing. And I, I think it's interesting to me that if Douglas had started say in Flagstaff and gone south, there's a really good chance that the observatory would have been somewhere in the south. Again, where he happened to be when Percival Lowell said, fine, like, okay, enough testing. Um, that, like I said, the conditions weren't, they weren't bad. They were good in Flagstaff. And Flagstaff has proven to be a good location for astronomy, but so is Tucson. I mean, there's more observatory area in Southern Arizona. Um, and so I think partly because there was a couple of days of bad weather in Tucson. If Lowell had had Douglas do like a whole year of site testing, you know, he would have seen that overall the climate's probably better. Um, there's not as much snow down there. But, you know, first of all, Lowell was just in a hurry. And I, I, I'm firmly convinced if it, you replayed it and, like I said, changed the order, it's a good chance Flagstaff wouldn't have been um, the choice. But it was. And so they, Douglas still did test some other sites. And um, while he was waiting for the equipment to get here, um, he tested other sites in the area. And I, this picture is kind of neat. It shows a couple of people around a campfire, but it's great because it's the only picture we have showing the boxes that carry the tripod and the telescope. And it's hard to see those, we can't zoom in very much here, but you can see from this, they, whoops, you can see from this, they do look like, you know, kind of coffin-like boxes. And you can see why, you know, the one stagecoach driver had a bit of a problem with that. Um, so, so Douglas is waiting for the big telescope, tests some other sites. First of all, Lowell on April 21st says, okay, um, use site 11. That's that site on the side of Hill where Dave's in us now. Let's set the observatory up there. Um, the telescopes and equipment had actually been sent to Tombstone um, because that's where they thought they were going to be setting up. But then they, they had to get them sent to Flagstaff. And then here's another telegram. These are all in our archives. This is April 23rd. And essentially it says ground broken. Um, town gives land and builds road. Ephemeris received. So the community of Flagstaff um, like all the communities that Douglas visited, they were really interested and, and went out of their way to try and encourage Douglas to, to help convince Lowell to set up their uh, observatory there. And so Flagstaff was no different. The community leaders um, wrote this letter on May 2nd, um, and the DJ Brandon was the president of the Board of Trade. He signed it on behalf of the community and several dozen of community leaders signed off on this and deeded five acres of land and also agreed to build a road to go up um, to the observatory, um, which they did. And so the, the seeing was decent. Um, maybe more importantly, Percival Lowell's patience had run out. So he wanted to do where Douglas was, which is Flagstaff and the, the town was very open to having them there. Um, they would build a road, they would give some land. And through the years, Lowell would acquire a lot more land. Today, we own about 750 acres. And that's a nice buffer from growth, uh, from houses getting put up right next to the observatory. Um, so all those reasons were great. And, and the observatory was um, less than a mile from the train station. So it's on the side of the hill just west of downtown Flagstaff. If you come into Flagstaff, you see the big dome on top of the hill. But it was really easy to get to, especially once the town built the road. And so for Percival Lowell, who would be traveling, he wouldn't spend all his time here. He could hop on a train and it wouldn't take him long to get up there. So lots of really great reasons for, for setting up in Flagstaff. Um, they, they got the telescope parts. Here's this guy sitting on the tube of the telescope. Um, they built it. And I'm going to go back and do this once or twice. Um, this telescope is 
um, the one they built initially, he had borrowed this from Harvard College Observatory. And, um, and you, if you look at the trees on either side, there's one on the left, one on the right, and then one kind of in the foreground to the right. Um, this is where they use this borrowed telescope and, um, and this borrowed dome. After the first year, it had snowed a lot. And so Lowell was thinking maybe it wasn't such a good place to set up. And in fact, had um, Douglas done like a, in hindsight, you know, a full year say of site testing, if they had seen the snow that came down in the early days there, maybe they would have chosen something else, but they didn't. But after that first year, Lowell returned that telescope and the dome and he ordered a larger one. And when that larger one came in, <coughs> they used it in Mexico for a while, then brought it back. And it's the one that sits there today, the one you can see around from around town. And it's on the same location as this one that they borrowed. As I transition again, look at those trees. And you can see this tree was trimmed to the left a little bit, but those trees and the one in the foreground to the upper right. So it's on the exact same location as the first one they tested. So um, as I said, I, I, I think it's an interesting story of how they um, did the site testing. There's a lot more stories, a lot more uh, facts that Douglas records, like the hotels he stayed at, many of which are still in operation. Um, some of the places he visited, like San Xavier um, and in other places, um, his notes about the kind of wildlife, the, the quality of the air. I mean, some of it's really dry. It's just barometric pressure and stuff like that. But there's a lot of really neat nuggets of information um, that, that you can get. So I think it's a neat story to, to understand why Lowell got here. And like so many things, I think if you replayed history and changed it a little bit, we might very well not be in Flagstaff. And, and again, most importantly, because Lowell was in a hurry, if we did that again, if we replayed that history, um, maybe Lowell says, okay, spend a little bit more time here and Douglas visits a few more sites. But, but that's, how it, that's how it turned out. Um, so with that, I'd like to thank you for joining me. Um, I'm gonna stop sharing this program. This is a, a nerd shot of me years ago when we used to do um, living history programs. So I decided to, to uh, dress up and, um, and then kind of do a pose similar to what this guy was doing in Tucson. So let me, let me stop sharing here and close my program. Um, thanks for joining us today. And I think um, we can now sit back for a second, take a breath. And then if you have any questions, um, I've got my, my chat box open, but also I think um, we can also just, you know, unmute you and ask questions if you like. So thanks and I'll turn it back to the incomparable. That's you. <laughs> <laughs> um, so this is just sort of a curiosity question in um, terms of how Douglas uh, decided to travel, um, like the determinations of the modes of travel. So yeah. he was taking a stagecoach uh, from Tempe to Prescott. Is that right? And, um, or was it? Yeah. Yes. There, okay. There's a, there was a stage, then, it took stages on a couple different legs, but the big one was Tempe to Prescott on yeah. that cruddy old highway. So what do you think was the reason that he decided to maintain his stage coach trip and not travel with his probably very beloved piece of equipment. Right. Yeah, that's a great question because it it doesn't seem like that's something you would let out of your sight, yeah. especially in, a, in an unusual place. And you're pretty unusual for carrying this stuff. I think that he was trying to um, probably get as much view of the area as he could. Um, he wasn't, he wasn't interested in site testing 
El Paso or Albuquerque or those places where the train was going. But by writing the stagecoach, it was an opportunity to see, you know, more of, of um, Arizona between Tempe and Prescott. So I think, I think that might have been part of it. Um, but, but I thought I wondered that too. And, and it's not like they didn't know the stagecoach didn't take that long. I mean, it was known to be um, a really long <laughs> trip. So it would have been a lot more comfortable to go on the train. Right. Yeah, it's a little bit different today with, you know, four wheel drive vehicles and, you know, I mean, astronomers still, still do site testing today if they're gonna build a new observatory. Our, our Lowell Discovery Telescope, um, which is southeast of, of um, Flagstaff by 40 miles in a little area called Happy Jack. Um, it's been, gosh, a dozen years plus that staff did site testing all over Northern Arizona, much as Andrew Douglas did, um, looking for you know, the quality of the sky. So, so a lot of the technique is the same. It's just more improved um, instruments, computerized that you can record stuff easier. And of course, travel is so much easier and faster. Kevin, can you talk a little bit, if you can put it in context to um, the, uh, the interest in exploring scientific topics in Arizona or the, the desert Southwest um, or the West during that time period, right? The 1890s, maybe even the early 1900s um, that, you know, I know that, I mean, obviously in territorial Arizona, they were looking to get people to start coming out here and what would attract people to what were the, the major towns at that time, what would bring investment and what would bring capital and that kind of thing. Um, it's interesting um, with the connection to science. So you can talk about if there was what other scientific explorations or whatever was happening in Arizona territory at that time, um, sure. maybe agriculture or in geology or in other things like that. And then maybe in conjunction with the, with the, um, the early universities and, and that kind of thing. Well, you know, I mean, probably most famously is um, John Wesley Powell going, going down the Colorado river in 1869 and a, another trip down there. And that was, um, that was certainly a, a voyage of exploration, but you know, that the early railroad surveys that came through town and, and not just railroad, but also um, uh, wagon roads, um, almost every one of those, and there are several that came through, I'm looking for routes from the East to the West. Um, most that came through had naturalists, as they were called, who did everything, botany, geology, and everything. So they initially, they would come through and collect specimens. And then later of those transportation surveys, they would do more science, collect more specimens. And then you had actual dedicated expeditions like John Wesley Powell um, looking for you know, to get down the Colorado River, but also doing a lot of science along the way. And then, and then a few years later, um, C. Hart Merriam visited the San Francisco peaks in north of Flagstaff um, and used those in developing his life zone concept that, you know, there's different plant and animal life as you go up in elevation. That was, I mean, that was critical, Arizona was critical to him developing that. I mean, I, I think that's, not as well known today, but it was a Miriam's life zone is, is huge. Um, and then you had people like um, um, Fuchs, who was an archaeologist, and he knew people like Bucky O'Neill, who knew the territory, and you know, was trying to document um, archaeological remains, um, Native American um, former habitats and such. And so and so they came out here and started um, studying different archaeological sites. Um, down in Tucson, the Desert Book, down, I mean, the, um, the Carnegie Institute developed the, um, the lab on top of um, one of the hills we talked about before. 
That was, I think, 1903 when they set up shop. And so, you know, even before Arizona was a, was a state, a lot of people, you know, and this is, this is an unusual, you know, that Arizona had been this Wild West territory a few people went to. Um, now they're trying to develop it more um, and bring more people in. Also, you know, we need to learn more about it. And so you send scientists there to learn more about it. So that's all part of it. But then on top of that, I think Arizona is really unique with its scientific resources. Um, you know, with, with the great range of geology and paleontology, fossil life, and the plant life. As we talked about the, the life zones, you go, you go through several different life zones up to like alpine or subalpine in the peaks. And so um, for so many different scientists, the Forest Service, the, the first Forest Service field station was in Arizona. Um, and so it's, it's really quite a, quite a legacy. And, you know, I think, I think that certainly had to do something to do with the development of Arizona as a state because it brought in a lot of different people studying um, the scientific resources and, and, and the resources continue to be valuable. Um, astronomy alone drives billions of dollars a year through the, well, not billions, it might be a couple billion now, but a lot of money through Arizona's coffers each year through scientific research and education and visitation of places like Lowell. Um, and then, you know, you look at like astronomy studies at ASU and U of A. Um, I mean, Arizona is one of the places in the world to do astronomy and, you know, name a spacecraft up on Mars or another planet and it's got Arizona ties. Um, ASU and U of A in particular are involved with so many of the rovers and um, the USGS here in Flagstaff. Um, they're involved with a lot of mapping and rover activity. And so it, it really, you know, continues to be a hotbed for science. How's that for a really long um, answer? That, that was very good. Another area, of course, in the late 1800s and early 1900s, um, and especially in uh, southern Arizona, central Arizona would be looking at um, climate and um, uh -huh. and farming. So like in the Chandler area, for example, and other places they were looking at cotton, how can they grow cotton and make that like a really bountiful cash crop because of the environment. But they were also testing citrus and, and other things too with uh, through their connections with um, the University of Arizona and the agricultural extension um, uh, research projects and things like that. So that was happening as well. We have a question, um, how often and to what extent did Lowell actually participate at the observatory? Um, Lowell, Lowell was fairly active. He did a lot of his own observing. He also had assistants who observed, but he wasn't on site all the time. He, he continued to travel a lot. He was out of action for several years when he had essentially a nervous breakdown. Um, so for several years, he was out of action, but the work at the observatory continued. Um, we, we have so much of his, of his drawings and his uh, notes from the telescope and others that worked with him. And so, you know, he had initially, Andrew Douglas was his assistant. Then he hired, through the years, he hired a few people. There was a, he had kind of a core of full-time staff, like two or three, and then some others that came and went on essentially what we would think of today as scholarships um, and, and that sort of thing. But, but Lowell did a, did a lot. And in fact, just a couple of years ago, we found the la his last observing log was, I think the day before he died, he had been at the telescope. He died of a stroke in 1916. Um, but he was, he, was, he was pretty active with it all. Yeah. And I saw, I saw another question, um, was Douglas the same person as, as like the Douglas mine? Um, and it's a different person. In fact, Andrew Douglas, he spells his name with two S's. And Douglas mine, I'm not sure um, the namesake, I'm not sure what that um, comes from, but it's a different Douglas. I, when I started working at Lowell, 
I always wonder, I, I also wondered if it was the same Douglas as the Douglas fir, um, but that was a different Douglas also, and also a Douglas that spells this name with a single S. And then um, I think James had another question about Lowell and um, what were some of the early accomplishments at Lowell? Talk a little bit about early discoveries or sure. early accomplishments. Well, initially, like I said, Lowell was Percival Lowell himself was um, very interested in proving there was life on Mars, and he didn't. I mean, in his mind, maybe he, he did by making these elaborate drawings of the canals, um, but we know those don't exist. It was some sort of optical illusion that he was seeing, and, and he wasn't the only one, um, but he was the most outspoken one about what those supposed canals meant, that they must indicate intelligent life. Um, so, so Percival Lowell was certainly fairly famous. He was kind of a Carl Sagan of his time, really promoting science, um, astronomy, this light, this idea that there's life out there. He wrote several popular books. He gave lectures to the public, um, lots of um, magazine and newspaper articles covered him. So he, he um, became famous for his Mars research. Um, he also studied other planets to try to understand how they all form and evolve. Um, I think to me, one of his greatest things was the people he hired because he hired dedicated people who really advanced the science. Um, one, one guy, VM Slifer, Vesto Melvin Slifer, um, detected the first evidence of the expanding universe. And VM Slifer's brother, E.C. E. Slifer, Earl Slifer, he developed photo photographic techniques that included what we know today as stacking um, that allowed them to really um, advance astrophotography and you know, try to, trying to photograph um, details on planets. Um, and, and the third one he hired, Carl Lampland, developed these instruments like um, different ones that were used to measure temperatures on planets by looking at the, by measuring the light. And so the people he hired were really important. And I think the other thing is, you know, he had this vision um, and, you know, his, his brother said he probably went to his grave unfulfilled because he never found his planet. I mean, he never um, proved life on Mars. And also he started looking for a planet um, and he died in 1916 before he found it. And his brother said that was his biggest disappointment, not finding that planet. But, and remember, Percival Lowell was driven to do something important in the name of the family. And, you know, to his mind, he, he might, you know, he never proved life on Mars, he never found his planet. But in hindsight, you know, what he established and the people he hired, I think brought him maybe more notoriety, more fame than he might have imagined. Because today, you know, we look back and Pluto was discovered because of him, he started the search for a planet and that led to the discovery of Pluto. The expanding universe was one of the most important discoveries of the 20th century. It showed us that the universe is much bigger and older than we thought. That was by one of the people he, he um, hired. And so, so after Lowell died, some of this happened, Pluto was discovered in 1930. And then later astronomers, um, the, the rings of Uranus were discovered by a team that included Lowell astronomers, the um, Pluto's atmosphere. I, and Pluto continues to be um, a major topic of study here. One of our scientists is on the New Horizons team, one of the leaders of the New Horizons team. And so there's been this legacy of research through the years that you know, kind of form, forms the foundation of what we do today. I'll keep talking, so I better stop there. <laughs> Um, can we, and I uh, wanted to ask you, Kevin, if you could talk a little bit about of what's happening at Lowell Observatory now. Is it open to the public uh, or in a limited capacity or well, you know, what's the timeline there in case folks like maybe during the summer or whatever want to get up where it's a little bit cooler and maybe see Lowell if they haven't before? Sure, Jean. Um, Lowell is, we're, we're open for, by reservation only for both daytime tours and nighttime telescope viewing. Um, and groups are limited to 10 people at a time. You don't have to 
it doesn't have to be just you and the group. You can join other people. And we have, you know, we have all the standard safety protocols in place. Um, you know, we're soon at the end of the, in a couple of days, we're going to go to our next phase of reopening, which allows us to offer more of these uh, reserved programs. And then it'll probably be still a while before we can go back to how we typically operate um, where you don't need reservations. Anybody can come in. And that's still going to be a while, but we're certainly moving in the right direction. And so there's these opportunities to visit in person with, with these um, reservation programs, but also, you know, like so many groups, you know, we developed, we've developed a lot of virtual programming that's really been good. And so, you know, like we have a, we have several programs a week ranging from discussions of upcoming science with astronomers to talking about um, upcoming celestial events or talking about historic things that have happened that I do sometimes. Um, so we have, we have one on May 25th, 26th, and um, that one is about um, the eclipse because there's a total lunar eclipse on the morning of May 26th. Um, and we can see this in Arizona. So I thought I'd mention not only that's the kind of programs that we're doing, um, but also that, you know, you don't need any special equipment to see a lunar eclipse. You need to have a view of where the moon is at the time. And for us in Arizona, it will be toward the west. Um, and then the times with that eclipse, um, the, this is going to be early morning or late night, depending on how you look at it. So on the morning of May 26th at 2.44 a.m., the moon starts getting eclipsed and totality is from 4.11 to 4.25. That's when the moon is completely in the shadow of Earth. Um, it'll look kind of orange, reddish color. And then it'll, it'll come out and still be partial. Um, and when the moon sets at 5.23, it'll still be a partial eclipse. So, so we'll be doing programming on that, but also that's just cool, you know, if you can get up a little bit early, you know, lunar eclipses are really neat to see. You don't, it's neat to have binoculars or a telescope, but you don't need that to be able to really see it. Um, so that's a neat thing to do. Okay, great. Um, I just, uh, are there any other questions? And then I'll kind of do my little wrap up here. Okay, good. Thanks everybody for coming today. Um, I'm going to highlight a couple things that are coming up at the Chandler Public Library and also with the Chandler Museum. Um, we do have another Our Stories coming in June. Unfortunately, I just got an email from our presenter for June um, asking if she can um, delay her presentation because she has a family situation. So I am going to be working on um, bringing Jana Bombersbach back um, at a later date and coming up with a new program topic for June. So um, just keep an eye out for an email about that revised um, event if you guys would like to attend again in June for our next program. Um, the Chandler Museum is going to be opening a new exhibit called Black and White in Black and White Images of Dignity, Hope and Diversity in America on June 29th. Um, so that's a new uh, photographic exhibit that will be coming out, um, coming from California. And then um, if you guys are still interested in, in uh, learning a little bit more about science and Arizona, we have our Science Matters series um, and we have that coming. So we have coming up actually on the 26th of May um, at 6.30 p.m. And these are all on our calendar, on our events calendar, on our website. Um, talking about um, some of the science around Arizona wildfires, kind of talking about changes in the environment um, and um, how um, professionals that deal with wildfires are having to deal with more and more of those wildfires and what they're looking at doing in relation to that. So it's called Arizona's modern wildfire situation. That's something we start hearing about right about now and it'll run through the summer. And so it'll be someone who's a county extension agent, be talking about what, uh, what we're looking at for that. 
And then in um, June, we will be having a colleague of Kevin's is going to be coming out, um, Dr. David Engelfaler, who is at uh, TGen and also Northern Arizona University. Um, and he is going to be talking about responding to a 21st century pandemic with 21st century science. So kind of looking at in the biomedical technology, what are some of the advances that we've seen that allow us to be able to combat a pandemic, um, whether it's the one that we've currently gone through or, or ones that are coming in the future. And then finally, kind of connecting back with what Kevin's been talking about, the race to Mars and solar system exploration on July 14th. And we'll be having someone come and talk about that. And also in relation to sort of Arizona's role in some of that exploration. Um, so hope that we will see some of your faces at those. Those are all virtual programs coming up. And um, I believe with that, uh, Kevin, anything else that you'd like to say? Oh, just thanks. Uh, it's been great working with Eugene as always. And thanks everybody for joining us today. I um, mean, if you have any questions about Lowell or more questions about the program, you can always get, or my, my email address is kevin at lowell.edu. Um, so I'd be glad to answer any questions you have if you think of something later. Thanks. All right, thank you. Thank you so much for joining us.